Welcome to this week's Autodesk Virtual Academy. I'm Nigel Lombayak, application engineer here. I'm sure I've talked to many of you on the phone and your host for today's Autodesk mm -hmm. Virtual Academy session. Uh, you might notice this really tall and muscular man next to me. It's Alex Alvarez, um, one of our engineers on our team. He works primarily uh, on the manufacturing side of things in both uh, Fusion 360, right. HSM, um, I guess all flavors of HSM, yeah. right? Yeah, a little bit of, uh, of everything, really. That's awesome. So today we're working on fourth axis milling. And Alex will explain that a little bit into the, once we get a little bit into the webcast, mm -hmm. what the benefits are of doing things um, with that extra axis, getting your parts to start rotating while you're milling. Absolutely. Um, and he'll go over the benefits of doing that. It saves time. And ultimately, that's all we really want to do. Mm -hmm. So uh, he'll go over that. Uh, if you have any questions, definitely type them into the GoToWebinar chat panel at any time. And one of us will go ahead and answer those, or we'll answer those during the dedicated Q&A section at the end of all of this. Absolutely. Uh, if you did watch last week's Fusion Friday, we um, and if you don't know what that is, we do have a bi-weekly. Bi-weekly, yeah, every other week. Bi-weekly, that's, that's what that is, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, a bi-weekly, not twice a week, but every other week, um, webcast for Fusion 360 itself. Um, on Friday, last Friday, we happened to do a similar webcast on how this is done within Fusion 360. If you're not using HSM and you're using Fusion 360, um, you can go ahead and refer yourself to that webcast. Um, but note that the workflows are pretty much generally the same, right? And that's kind yeah. of something we want to emphasize today um, is that HSM is the engine in both Inventor HSM and Fusion, Fusion 360, 360 in regards to the machining part of uh, machining part of things. Mm -hmm. So um, we're going to go over those. Uh, if you've seen some of the data or maybe some of the techniques before, it's because it is very, very similar. Right. Uh, so with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Alex here. All right. And Alex will be able to jump through a lot of these guys for us. Perfect. Thank you for that, Nigel. All right. So some learning objectives for today, right? So like Nigel mentioned, we are going to be talking about how fourth axis machines work. Where is that fourth axis coming from? What is, is it like 4D? Right. right? <laughs> we also want to make sure that you uh, correctly set up your part, right? So uh, there are a couple ways to to uh, go about that. Sometimes you do have to create some working planes. Um, sometimes you just have to uh, select a, a face in your model, right? So we are going to be uh, really going into into detail on how to correctly set up your part. And um, finally, some of the errors that people are experiencing also with the parts, right? Because when you do create a setup, sometimes uh, it, depending on the view that you're looking at, it looks like it's everything set up correctly, and then when you go out to post to your machine you're going to find that you have some sort of errors, right? So we'll walk you through those steps, um, everything from creating the setup to adding tool paths to posting out to your machine, right? So pretty jam-packed webinar here. All right, so this is typically what you're going to see uh, when you have some sort of fourth axis capabilities, right? You're going to have a rotary table. You're going to have your part inside of uh, some sort of a chuck or some sort of, some sort of work holding. And the part's going to be the one that's going to be doing the rotating, right? So that's where your fourth axis comes from. If you take a look at the diagram, you see that the A axis is essentially the value in some sort of degrees that you're going to get inside your program. Now, you don't just have uh, the rotary table. You do have some sort of tilted head capabilities, right? So this is more common in uh, with routers, right? So if you're doing some sort of woodworking, uh, you may be familiar with uh, with these machines, or you may even have some at your shop, right? So take a look at the diagram, too, at the uh, word coordinate that we have there. It's rotating about the Y axis, right? So this is really important because if you are going to be doing your post modifications, you want to make sure that you note that in the post, right? So again, um, it's rotating about the Y axis, whereas in the rotary table, uh, you get the rotation about the X axis there. All right, so a common error that we usually see is direction is not supported for machine configuration. All right, so what does that mean? So if you guys take a look at the diagram here, the picture, we see that we have essentially a fourth axis part. Right? The setup that we have, the work corner system over here on the right, I mean, for the most part, it looks pretty straightforward. It looks like everything's uh, running smoothly. We have the X axis, which seems like it's running directly through the center of the part. Right, so what's going to happen when we rotate the view? We rotate the view, and we see that the x-axis uh, switched, and it's running parallel to this face that we have selected. Right, so if you do have some weird angles on your part, 
you are going to want to make sure that you have some sort of plane that's coplanar to um, the either the XY plane or the XZ plane, depending on which uh, angle you are going to be machining with, right? So um, let's go ahead and jump into Inventor and see how we would set this up. All right, so here I have the uh, model, right? I did go a little bit above and beyond to create the assembly. Uh, you don't have to do this. This does serve for uh, some, some visual purpose, right? You want to make sure that you don't have any collisions either with the chuck or with the tailstock. Uh, but again, this isn't uh, necessary, right, to, to do. So let's go ahead and hide a few of the assemblies here and tail stock. Actually, want to leave the stock visible so that we select it. All right, so we are in the 3D modeling environment of uh, Inventor, right? So let's go ahead and jump in cam environment. Again, if you do have uh, HSM, Inventor HSM, right? You are going to get this little tab over here on the top. So once you do install it or you download it, uh, just simply uh, restart Inventor and you should have access to this CAM tab up here, right? Uh, so now that we're in the CAM environment of Inventor, again, pretty straightforward workflow, right? In the sense that you're going to be starting from left to right. You're going to create your setup, add tool paths. You want to make sure that you simulate the tool paths that you have laid out, make sure that you don't have any collisions or maybe gouging. Uh, into the part here, and then finally post out to your machine, right? So uh, before you do do that, I highly recommend you set up your tool library. Right? You want to make sure that you have um, the tool set up as you would in your machine. You don't want to spend time or, or waste time uh, creating some of these tools as you're going through your uh, through your programming here, right? So like I mentioned, uh, we are going to be starting from left to right again with our setup. If you were new to this uh, environment or if you were just new to machining in general, right, you get what we call these little tool tips as we're going along. It gives us a, a brief description as well as a diagram or picture of what you're going to be doing when you select that command. All right, so for this one, we're going to be defining the general properties for the, uh, for the machining operations as well as setting our work coordinate system. All right, so that's how we want to start. Again, create setup. Our operation type is going to be milling. Uh, for this specific case, I do want to start off by selecting my stock first, right? So again, you have a couple options here. By default, you are going to go to a relative size box. So essentially, Inventor looks at your model, and depending on how much offset or how much extra material you want on the sides, the tops, and the bottoms, uh, you're going to get some sort of predefined stock here, right? Uh, it, Let's say this is this is actually extremely helpful if you don't know um, exactly what size material you will be needing. Right? So let's say that you want a relative size cylinder. Right, select your axis, and um, you get. Let's say you know that your material supplier sells in quarter inch increments. You'll know that the minimum diameter then that you'll need is three and a quarter. Right. For our case, though, we do have a solid already modeled. We can go ahead and select the solid. All right, let's go back to our setup. And right away, we got a preview of where our work corn is gonna be at, right? Where our G54, in our case, is going to be starting off from. Uh, it's the center of the cylinder. We don't want it there. We want to use the front face of the, the part as the initial position, right? So simply change this to a selected point. Let's go ahead and select the edge, and we get our work coordinate there, right? Again, you want to make sure that you have the correct model selected here. Uh, being that I did have both the model that I'm going to be working on and the stock visible, by default, it did select both of them to machine, right? So you want to make sure that you just have the single model selected by itself, right? So everything looks good here. Let's go ahead and OK that. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the visibility now for that model, right? So here we have a preview of our stock. Notice that we have this extra material. Now, again, that was just for work holding purposes. Uh, after machining, we are just going to uh, saw these off or just remove that extra material that we have there, right? Okay, so taking a look at this part, we do see that we have uh, a couple 
pockets, right? This one looks to be flat. This one looks to be wrapped around the cylinder. Again, we have some sort of wrap uh, pattern here, right? As well as this angled cut for the part, right? So typically the way I like to work about this is splitting it up, right? So having your indexing first or your simultaneous work uh, first and then taking care of, of the rest, right? So for, for my case, I am going to be starting off with the uh, indexing, right? So let's go ahead and start off with this pocket. Uh, note though how the Z axis is oriented in this case, right? So it's pointing this way and my pocket is essentially facing uh, a certain amount of degrees uh, up, right? So that means that the, the machine is going to have to rotate the part in order to get to this pocket. So what we can do then, instead of, of wasting time and really having the machine rotate, let's go ahead and change our setup so that we have our Z axis perpendicular to the face of this pocket. Right, that way as soon as the machine starts or the program starts, it's just gonna come straight down and machine this pocket out without having to rotate. Right? So again, let's go back into our setup. Let's edit that setup. And for our orientation, let's select a face that we want the Z axis perpendicular to. And we see that we get a visual representation then of how that's gonna look. I'm happy with that. Let's go ahead and click OK. And now, we have the correct setup there, right? All right, so starting off with this, again, indexing work first, right? So let's go ahead and do this pocket. Um, I can start off with a 2D pocket operation, right? Again, if you didn't know what a 2D pocket operation did, you can hover over the, the operation, and it, again, it gives you a brief description along with a picture of essentially how that tool path is going to look. All right, so let's go ahead and select that 2D pocket. Again, this workflow that we get, these five tabs are always going to be consistent whether you're working with 2D toolpaths, 3D toolpaths, um, even turning, right? You're gonna get the same workflow and again, making it a lot easier for you to go um, and program these parts as you're uh, programming um, each different part, right? So again, the first tab is going to be a tool tab. What tool are we going to be using to machine this operation? Uh, you can go ahead and create your libraries here, right? You do have preloaded tools already installed inside Inventor HSM um, that you can directly copy and add to your tool library, right? Depending on how many tools you have available at your shop for. So for this operation, I am going to be selecting a quarter inch flat end mill. Let's go ahead and select that, right? So let's go ahead. The next tab over is going to be the geometry tab. What pockets do we want to machine? We want to machine this pocket here. We get this little blue shade indicating to us what's going to get machined. Um, I'm happy with that. Let's go ahead and click OK. Right, and we quickly get a preview of how that tool path is going to look. Right, you can go ahead and simulate this. Turn on the stock. So there you have the tool ramping down. Speed it up. So this is more like your traditional, uh, your traditional tool path, right? Where essentially you selected a contour and it starts uh, creating offsets and machining outwards, right? So we started towards the center of the part and now it's coming around and machining outwards, right? So take a look at the simulation. Notice how much of the tool is engaged, right? So we have a decent amount of the tool engaged into the material. As we come into that fillet, notice how you get more of it engaged, right? So as you're coming here, um, you would want to maybe slow down the tool or maybe even not even take these, these full passes. Maybe you want to do multiple depths, right? So that's an okay tool path, right? Again, we would have to maybe step down and not not try to machine all that material in one in, in one go, right? So a much better tool path then would be our 2D adaptive strategy, right? So that's one of our, our really money makers that HSM has. Um, so we have 2D adaptive over here, but again, we're gonna be using the same tool, we're gonna be using the same contour 
let's go ahead and just create a derived operation. 2D milling, 2D adaptive. I'm not going to click on anything else, but OK. Right, and we get this much better looking toolpath, right? So again, notice how we are taking this constant engagement, right? We have this constant engagement as the tool is coming around. Right? Essentially what that means then is you're not gonna have this, uh, this cyclic loading on the tool, meaning less wear on the tool, and you can really run and, and push your tools a lot faster now that you don't have these, um, these high spikes in, in, in tool load, right? So from here, uh, you can change the the helix of the adaptive. That is going to be a pretty deep, uh, deep cut. So you can go ahead and add some sort of a ramping taper angle um, of, let's say, four degrees. You can even increase this depending on the tool manufacturer, right? You would get these values from them. Um, I've seen some pretty crazy values out there. So again, tool manufacturers are starting to really notice um, these high-speed machining strategies, right? And they're creating tools uh, that are much more suitable for these operations, right? So highly recommend you you start doing some uh, some more research into how you can push your tools a lot faster. Okay, okay so now we have this tape rod that's going down. Again, that's gonna help with chip evacuation as you're going down and machining this pocket. All right. So now let's go ahead and focus then on this other angled cut, right? So again, we can go ahead and do another uh, another adaptive strategy, right? So let's go ahead and start off now with a 3D adaptive toolpath. So difference between 3D adaptive and 2D adaptive, um, 3D adaptive or 3D toolpaths essentially look at the model, then they look at the stock that you have predefined, and then the toolpath tries to get as close to as it possibly can to the model, right? Removing as much stock as possible, um, depending on the, the model that you have based, right? So again, if you are going to be doing a few changes, uh, you know that the part's gonna have maybe change in heights, change in pockets, try to think ahead and maybe use a few of these 3D, 3D toolpaths uh, to help you with the, the, the smoother transition between uh, model iteration, right? So again, using these three toolpaths, let's go ahead and use this adaptive. We can go ahead and use then a half inch, right? Going back into my library. Notice how my work coordinate system is set up. So by default, then the tool is going to be directly in line to that Z axis, right? So then we have to orient essentially the, the planes correctly to how we want to machine, right? So again, this is going back to what I was saying. If you were to go ahead and enable tool orientation and just select your Z axis or your face, right? Notice what's going to happen, right? So you have this um, X axis pointing off in a, in a different direction. Let's go ahead and see if we have some sort of uh, better, better planes or better selections to select that, okay? So you can expand a few of these, right? And then see which plane lines up with that angle cut, right? So you can see that the X, Y plane is the one that's in line there. So you can go ahead and turn that on. Go back to the cam tab. Again, selecting the tool. It's going to be using a half inch flat. Now for the tool orientation, for the z-axis, you can simply select that plane that we have selected, flip the orientation, right, and then pick your selection, right? So we wanna go ahead and machine this. Notice that we get the projected um, contour there, right? And now typically, we, when we're working with 3D tool paths, we want the tool center on boundary, right? So depending on uh, the material that you have on the sides, maybe the, the work holding that you're working with, you typically want to work with center on boundary, right? So let's go ahead and take a look at what that gives us and go ahead and select that. All right, so here we get the tool path. All right, it looks okay, right? The only issue is that we see that it's 
ramping down, right? It's helixing into the center of the part. Whereas we can have the tool coming on the outside of the part and machining away this way, right? So let's go ahead and change that then and allow the tool to machine outside the boundary, right? Now again, with 3D tool paths, notice the only options that I changed here, right? Uh, I selected my tool, I went into the geometry tab, selected the plane that was going to be normal to my tool, and then I selected the boundary and uh, selected the tool container, right? Um, a lot of people get start getting frustrated with 3D tool paths because they start selecting or changing multiple options in here. Maybe the tool path doesn't look exactly to, uh, to what they were expecting. And either they ask to start all over or they just completely give up on 3D tool paths, right? So one of my, one of my biggest recommendations is um, start small with 3D tool paths, right? Change a few options. Uh, see how the tool path looks, uh, then come back and, and do those uh, extra edits, right? So that way, when you do change something and either you get an error or maybe you get uh, something that looks off in the tool path, you know exactly what you did to cause that error, right? So again, um, I enabled tool outside boundary. Okay. All right, and we have this tool path here. Okay. So now with this, what you can do then is uh, do some sort of derived operation and do a finishing op, right, on the angle face. So you can do a parallel. That can be one of them. So you can go over here. Instead of going up here and selecting the parallel toolpath, simply create a derived operation, right? Select parallel. And then again, selecting the tool that we want to work with. Eighth inch ball. And then selecting the step over for it, right? You can say 20 thousandths. Okay. And we get a parallel tool path on that angled face, right? Now, another option could have been uh, actually a lot better is rotate the part, right? And then have the tool come down and machine this angled face, right? So again, depending on the tool height or the tools that you have, uh, that could have been another option, right? Machine half of it and then rotate 180 degrees and then machine the other half, right? So then that would have actually been a lot more efficient in the sense that we didn't have to spend time uh, or extra time doing this finishing op on the angled face, right? So that, that's another option. Um, now, this, okay, so we machine the pocket, we machine this angled face. The last part then of the indexing would be the drilled holes. So let's go ahead then and do a drilling operation. This is going to be using uh, a NEM drill bit, so 3P2. All right. So again, notice that my tool is directly in line to the Z-axis, right? So if I come in here and I try to select a whole face, it's not gonna let me, right? Even if I try to select this one, it's not gonna let me because again, the hole isn't correctly in line with my work corner, right? So let's go ahead and change that using tool orientation. And then we wanna go ahead and flip the Z axis. So now if I go ahead and select that hole, now we get an appropriate tool path, right? We get a preview too of how deep that drill bit is gonna go into the part. We can go ahead and change that. Have it go 50 thousandths past the bottom of the hole. All right now, typically, um, something that we're used to doing is enabling select same diameter, right? So if we go ahead and click that, click okay, we're gonna get an error, right? Again, because the other holes aren't directly in line or, or uh, yeah, directly in line to our work coordinate system. So let's go ahead and edit that and remove that select same diameter. Okay. So now instead what we want to do then is create a pattern for that operation. Right? So select this, it's going to be four holes. And then we get the appropriate tool path there, right? All right, so that was one of them. 
Uh, what we can do again is create a folder. Drag it over here to the top. Name it indexing, right? I'm trying to be as organized as you possibly can here. And just drag them inside the folder, right? So now we can close that. Uh, let me go ahead and turn off that XY plane. All right, so now let's go ahead and work with the wrapped geometry that we have. All right, so we're going to have this little coil here going around it and then this wrapped pocket on the part as well, right? So again, same steps. Let's go ahead and start off with a roughing operation, our 2D adaptive. Again, selecting the tool, right? So this is a very repetitive um, workflow that you have to, to really go about. But again, once you have these operations selected, once you have a working recipe, you can then go ahead and create templates and just start have or have all these tool paths or operations in line so that when you do create something similar, you can just go from that template, uh, reselect the geometry, right, and then be a lot more efficient with your time. All right, so for this one, we are going to be using a quarter inch flat once more. Now, for this case, for wrap geometry, notice that we don't have to select tool orientation, right? We have this wrap tool path option. The wrap cylinder is going to be this cylinder here. The pocket is this pocket here as well. We get a preview of the wrap uh, geometry. Let's go ahead and leave some material here on the wall. Uh, so we left 10 thousandths, right? So if you, I highly recommend to, um, if you haven't updated HSM to update, right? You do have both ways adaptive now, right? So again, depending on the material, this may be something that's beneficial to you, right? Uh, so go ahead and, and try to experiment with both ways adaptive. All right, radial stock to leave, 10 thousandths. Give us some time to calculate. Again, with wrap tool paths, it, it takes a little bit longer to calculate, right? But here we see that we get the, the tool path for that, right? So again, it's helixing into the, uh, the material here. You can go ahead and do the same thing similar to the adaptive and have some sort of ramp as it's coming down. So now what I can do is have a finishing operation on the wall of this wrap pocket, right? Or this uh, wrap geometry. So again, 2D contour, instead of doing that, we're gonna be using the same tool, same geometry, um, just a different tool path. So 2D milling, let's go do a 2D contour. Again, notice that wrap cylinder is already selected. The contour selection is already there. Go ahead and click OK. And we get the tool path going around the wall there, finishing the wall, right? All right, so now let's go ahead and jump over to this wrap pocket. Um, again, it's going to be the same workflow, 2D adaptive. So let's go ahead and hit Control D to duplicate that, that tool path. Drag it down. We're going to be using the same wrap cylinder. That didn't change. The only thing that's going to change is the pocket that we're going to select. Select that. Go ahead and click OK. All right. And then do, again, a duplicate of this contour. Bring it down. And once more, change the pocket that we're going to be selecting, right? So select that, and we get the appropriate tool path there, right? All right, so then last step then in this part would be the engraving and the uh, little chamfer that we have here at the end, right? So again, let's go ahead and um, take care of that. So let's go ahead and do a 2D contour. Uh, using, again, the tool that we're going to be selecting, this 3 8 chamfer mill, and then selecting the geometry, right? So. Um, you can go in here, select the geometry. You can also select the wrap tool path since it is wrapping around the cylinder. Contour selection. Notice what's going on though, right? We are getting these individual selections. Um, what you can do then is just click once more on the edge that you selected. We are going to be using a closed contour. So 
hover on uh, some of these edges until you see that, that visualization of the closed contour and make sure that you click OK. All right, and then keep on doing that for the rest of the letters here. All right, close contour. So as you're going here, make sure that you do select one that's on the top profile of it. Right, so as you hover, notice that you get this other preview of the contour going down, right? So if you were to do that, the tool would plunge down into the material, right? So you want to make sure that you do select the correct uh, contour there. All right, just a few more here. Selecting this one, okay, and then last one. Oops. You can always delete the selections that you have. Uh, it's also really important that you rotate the part, right? So sometimes when you do the rotation, um, you do get a different selection here, right? So you want to make sure that you have yeah. So that one's not going to work, right? So again, try to select one that is. Now these can sometimes get really tricky, right? So again, uh, you might be thinking why I didn't use uh, the engrave tool, right? So the difference between contour and engrave is that engrave uh, would essentially look at the lettering that we have here, and then it would uh, create that profile through the center of the part, right? So again, de depending on the, the style of uh, engraving that you want, uh, that's really what you you would have gone with, right? So for some reason, uh, this one doesn't want to go ahead and select. Uh, you can hold. Oh, okay. So then, now finding one that's going to work. So this one's going to work. Go ahead and click OK. All right. So I'm not going to do the rest here. So let's go ahead and again uh, take off this chamfer and stock to leave, right? So now we're not going to leave stock on this uh, selection. We want to go ahead and remove, let's say, an extra three, three to four thousandths on this, right? So essentially what that's going to do is it's going to drive the tip of the tool three thousandths deeper than the surface, and it's going to give us the appropriate toolpath there, right? So we take a look at the toolpath. We see that it's leading in which we don't want, right? So let's go ahead and change that. We don't want any lead-ins or lead-outs. And click OK. All right, so the last step now then would be the chamfer here. All right, so last step here would be the chamfer. So let's go ahead and do, again, a 2D contour. Uh, selecting the contour that we're going to be using. Let's go ahead and use Wrap Toolpath. Right, and what's going to happen? We're going to get this error because it doesn't like that closed loop. Right, so again, um, an option to go around that is go back into the model environment and just create your sketch here. Right, so let's go ahead and create a quick circle. Uh, project geometry. Create your circle. Have these equal. All right, so now what you want to do then is just go ahead and trim some of this geometry, right? So you can go ahead and offset a certain amount. Let's say that's fine. This is just to show you guys how to go about it. All right, so then trim some of this up. Go ahead and break the link for this. All right. All right. So now, if we go back into the cam, notice we do get these check marks, right? These red X's indicating to us that, hey, you changed something in the modeling space. Go ahead and regenerate your toolpaths, right? So, again, simply selecting the setup, um, hitting Control G, you do get that regeneration. 
finish the sketch. Go back into cam and do 2D contour once more. Let's see if we get this single sketch. All right. So what we do now again, wrap the toolpath around the edge. All right. So we get again that toolpath. And now what you would want to do then is notice how the toolpath is going to stop at one of these points. Go ahead and use tangential extension distance. Um, let's say in our case by a quarter. So that way it doesn't stop here and leave that little slit of material, right? So you can go ahead and select that. All right, and we get the toolpath going around there. All right, so let me regenerate this. Make sure the index scene is going to be generated as well. And that pretty much covers it for this fourth axis part, right? So let me go ahead and turn off the visibility, go back into cam and simulate then what we have. All right, so here we have our initial first pocket ramping down. There's a 3D toolpath. Right. Then there's a parallel going up and down, finishing that angled part. There's a wrap toolpath, right? So notice that we are getting some sort of error here. And again, if you hover over the red check mark, right, let's see what that's telling us, right? We get that indication telling us that there's some sort of rapid collision with the stock. You can slow it down to see what's going on here. You can zoom into the toolpath, right? So let's go back in here and let's see what happened. Uh, doesn't look like it's showing exactly. All right, slow this down a little bit and then let's see what happens. Yeah, so it looks like it's just a bug. Uh, Tools ramping down over here. Uh, let me see if I change the color of the stock. That might be what's going on. Yeah, so it looks like we just had some sort of a glitch there, right, with the uh, with the graphics. Um, you can see that the tool is plunging down over here on the center of the part and then helixing its way down into it. Let me just make sure that it doesn't collide here. All right. And now you can speed it up a little bit. Okay, so there we have the contour getting finished. Right, and now we have the wrapped pocket. Right, so we do see here though that it is some sort of, uh, it's, it's gouging a little bit into that pocket, right? So I'll explain why in a little bit um, with this wrap toolpath. Then we have the uh, lettering, and then finally we have the, the chapter part there, right? All right, so um, again, going back into this wrap pocket that we have, right? So we go ahead and to this uh, quick diagram, right? So essentially this is how your wrapped geometry would work. You have your wrapped pocket, which the, the angled face would be going or pointing directly in line to the center of the part. So as the part or the tool is coming around and finishing, right? Look at what's happening. Right? We have the center of the tool, again, pointing directly to the center of the part. That's the, by definition, the, um, definition of fourth axis, right? We don't have fourth axis capabilities. Uh, so the center of the tool is always going to be pointing directly in center of the part. And as it's coming in here, it's either going to leave some extra material, or if you select the bottom selection, it's going to try to compensate and land somewhere in between the part here, and it's still going to remove or gouge a little bit of material, right? So if you are the one that's designing the part, um, try to make sure that you correctly go about this, right, and compensate for either the, the tool that you're going to be using and select those edges uh, or create those edges appropriately, right? All right.
right, so let's go back in here, fourth axis. And so we're done with this uh, programming. Let's go ahead and then finally post out to the machine. Again, finally posting out uh, using this Haas A axis, right? You do have hundreds of other posts already included in, in Inventor. Um, if you do want or, or if you do have uh, fourth axis capabilities and you don't see your post here, uh, again, you can either modify your post, go online to see if maybe someone else has already created it. Uh, and if that, that's not the case, uh, reach out to us, right? We have, uh, we also do post modifications here at Gatif, so if you need help or, or maybe guidance in how to create or add that extra fourth axis, um, feel free to reach out to us, right? So give it a name, four, five, six, seven. Right, a axis, again, you have some built-in user properties in here already that you can select on or off. And then finally, post up. Right, so, so the first pocket, remember how it was in line or perpendicular to our work coordinate, so we don't have um, any rotation there, right? So if we go ahead and come down here, right? So this is the other adaptive. You can hover over this, control F. This is the second adaptive. Notice that we get then that A value, right, with some sort of degrees um, rotating the part, right? All right. Again, some sort of degree there, right? So, all right. So that's pretty much what I had for the uh, for the demo. Again, if you have guys have any questions, this is the, the time to ask. Um, and again, feel free to ask questions about any of the topics or softwares that we have here, right? Uh, we work or we specialize here at Kativ with all manufacturing softwares or products that Autodesk has. Um, so again, any questions you may have about the, the uh, softwares or the collections, feel free to ask away. Um, so at this point, it looks like we have a question. Uh, it says, can we create our own tool? Uh, so I'm assuming that you're asking if we can create our own uh, custom uh, form tool, and you can. Right? So you can either create a sketch, or if you have your part, you can uh, your 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 file. You can bring it into uh, Inventor and uh, bring that tool in and and use it for your tool library. Right? Um, again, you can email tool. I believe you have the option in here, right? Yeah. So your form mill tool, right? So again. You would simply select the tool and uh, bring it into your, your tool library here. All right, so at this point, okay, so we have one more question, it looks like. Um, what if I don't see Wrap Toolpath available in uh, Inventor? So if you don't see Wrap Toolpaths, that means that uh, you don't have HSM Ultimate. Um, again, so, Fourth and fifth axis capabilities is only available in HSM Ultimate. So again, if you don't see that, then that, that means that you don't have um, those capabilities, right? Or the, that, ex, that, that extra um, HSM software that, that you need. All right. So with that, guys, it looks like we don't have any more questions. Uh, oh, looks like we did get one. OK, so does the center of the tool always have to point to the center of the part, which will result in gouge? Or can the tool be offset, which will prevent the gouge? So um, you can offset the contour, right? So again, if we go back into the 2D contour for this, uh, offset, wrap radius offset, right? So if you play around with this value, you can offset the contour a little bit and get somewhere close to the um, to to the to the pocket or to the dimensions that you have for your pocket, but yeah, the the tool by default it's always going to be pointing directly in center to the axis, right? And that's again uh, because we don't have fifth axis capabilities. If we did have fifth axis capabilities, then we could have rotated this uh, this angle, and it wouldn't have been directly in line with this um, with the center, right? So again. Being that that the tool is is straight down and the part's going to be the one that's rotating, uh, you can't offset the the tool center axis. But yeah, again, the the closest you can get is either 
um, doing that offset or maybe uh, trying to play around with a 3D toolpath and, and try to get some sort of a, a morph spiral in here, right, and getting a better finish for that pocket. That's, that's possible. Awesome.